Well, hello, everybody. And uh, let me start out by saying I've been down for the last three days with a really nasty sinus cold. Um, you know, I have hay fever in the summer and everything. My sinuses are always really sensitive to, you know, trees and all that. And living in Pennsylvania, that's one of the worst places you could be for that kind of allergies. But anytime I get a sinus cold, it's always worse because of my allergies on top of that. And I'm good for about one cold like this about once every two or three years. So it was due time. So <laughs> it's breaking up now. Although you may hear me sneezing and blowing my nose throughout the, the video here. I'll try to spare you that by shutting the video off for those things. But I can't stand sitting around any longer. I had to come down and do something. So anyways... I want to give you an update on where we are with this and this video we're going to do a little bit of talking about a little bit of theory of how this thing works I'm starting to get a little better understanding of it and starting to under appreciate a little bit more I guess I could say why the designers at Pioneer did what they did the way they did um, it's really an interesting concept that they used when they designed this and I can only imagine what the F30 or the F26 must be like because um, it probably this was kind of I, I would call this unit the prototype for what the F26 was to become and that would have been like the more refined version but I don't know I've never seen a schematic of one and I've never even seen one in real life so hopefully I have uh, somebody who thinks they may have a line on one and uh, so I may get a chance to see one here sometime and we'll do a video but anyhow you know non-conventional problems uh, sometimes require non-conventional troubleshooting techniques and because of that I kinda had to come up with some unique ideas for kind of dividing this thing into into little modules and kind of ruling out different things so the first thing that I did and I'm gonna and we're gonna start our video with is I swept this front end circuit with my tracking generator out of my uh, spectrum analyzer and then looked at just kind of looked at the output and that was very easy to do because the test points were already there for me to connect now something you have to understand about doing tests like this is sometimes your test equipment can actually give you uh, readings that you may think is a problem but it's really your test equipment what do I mean by that so for instance I have this little homemade probe that I use on my spectrum analyzer and the whole purpose of this probe is to protect the spectrum analyzer and to introduce a very high impedance uh, to the device under test. So it really serves two purposes. The problem is there are capacitors and, and components inside this little circuit and this thing was really designed to work in the HF range so you know up upwards of you know 50 to, to 90 50 to 80 megahertz something like that is a, would pretty much be the limit and of course when you're dealing with FM broadcast you're really in the VHF range um, as high as 108 megahertz you might as well say and even a little higher than that if you're looking at the you know uh, your harmonics you know with your local oscillator and so forth because there's actually frequencies above that you can produce so anyways so this will will still read those uh, frequencies but it may give you some distorted waveforms so you have to be able to kind of understand your test equipment that you know if you're seeing something abnormal on your spectrum analyzer does it have to do more with there's a problem in the tuner or is it because of the test equipment you're using in this case the probe so that's just a little caveat and anything you do while I'm on this subject uh, any of you who are new any any of you who normally work on radio equipment already know all this stuff it's total review but for those of you who don't anytime you introduce anything to a 
to an RF circuit, especially at the front end of a tuner like this, this stuff is ultra, ultra sensitive. Even your body, you, you are a walking capacitor when you think about it. Um, if you go back to, through my videos and you look at the series I did on the Jackson Bell T TRF receiver, I did a little demonstration where all I had to do was move my hand around the RF tubes and it would cause all kinds of noise. And that was the capacitance from my body loosely coupling to that circuit. Um, so you understand that just by taking this cover off, you're changing properties of things going on inside here. Just like when I was working on the synthesizer circuit, just by removing this metal cover, I was introducing things in there. And, and that's to be understood. You can still tune everything in, but realize when you put these covers back on, all of your adjustments are going to be out and you're going to have to go through that alignment a second time. They're not going to be way out, but they're going to be out. So, all right, nose blowing time. Okay, I'm back. That's better. So, two things, taking the cover off of an RF, you know, front end of a tuner, uh, the metal shields like this, any of this shielding, or introducing any kind of test equipment, even a high impedance or anything, uh, just these wires alone are capacitors. You know, at high frequencies, the higher the frequency, the more susceptible to those things you're going to, you're going to see because the lower the capacitance you need to make a big change. You know, in an, in an, even in an AM broadcast radio, even that can be affected by outside things, but not nearly to the extent that's, that these kinds of signals will be, especially when you're dealing in microvolts. And, and higher frequency VHF frequencies so I just wanted to, to mention that because uh, what you're going to see may not be exactly what the reality is in here but it, it's at least giving us an idea of what's going on and we can adjust things so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to connect this again just to show you what I'm talking about all right if you take a look where are we connecting everything so if I slide this schematic in here for a second, you can see that the antenna input, L1, is right here on TP1 and TP2, or point 0.1 and point 0.2 of the front end board. And the output is going to be pin 9 and 10. And this is kind of your RF chain. So here's your first RF amplifier. This actually has two RF amplifiers. Um, so, and it's a pretty, it's got a pretty good front end as far as uh, sensitivity goes. And then here's your mixer. So you see the dual gate MOS or dual gate MOSFET in there. So this is where you're mixing your two signals together. But in theory, even without the mixer, without the local oscillator, without any of that, I should be able to put a inject a signal here and it should pass all the way through to here um, and we should be able to watch as we tune it so what we're doing right now with the spectrum analyzer is we're sweeping a signal which goes from and you can see down here's your test points so here's your here's your goes into right here pins one and two here's your goes out which is pins eight and or nine and ten and there it is so this is going out to the uh, to the input of the spectrum analyzer and this is coming from the tracking generator and now first thing you need to understand I do not have this perfectly coupled uh, remember uh, the spectrum analyzer is 50 ohm and you can switch it to 75 ohm mine is capable of that I just didn't do it because I'm not really concerned about uh, levels, amplitudes, or anything like that. So we're not measuring amplitudes. I'm not going to get crazy with with uh, impedance matching. So there you go. And also because we have capacitances and things introduced in here, and we have the cover off, you're going to see some noise or some distorted waveforms from what's really going on when everything's all sealed up. So those are your two things to remember.
Now if we go over to our, our spectrum analyzer, what are we looking at? Well, I'm sweeping the entire FM broadcast range from 88 to 108, roughly, okay? And I have the center frequency set at 98.1 megahertz, and I am tuned right now to 98.1 megahertz. So you can see wherever I move my tuning dial, so I'm gonna, re, I'm gonna turn the tuning dial of the receiver. Do you see what's happening as I turn that? So let's go up to 100 megahertz. And if I move my marker to the peak, you'll see that's 100 megahertz. There it is, 100.0 megahertz. So you can so if you, if you understand how a spectrum analyzer can be used to check the front end of a receiver, that's what's going on. And as you tune around, you can actually see your local oscillator pop up in there. That, uh, that's going to be, so if I go to 98.1, that's going to move right along with it. Let's see here. And that one is sitting, uh, trying to reach around here. 107.9 and I think if you go ahead and check that that's going to be um, not quite 10.7 megahertz but again the the IF on this is not normal like a normal analog tuner so those things will change on this thing so anyways you can see that the front end is working and I've, I've tuned it in, I've aligned it as best I could um, using the spectrum analyzer. Now here's the thing, if you try to use, and what this is what my frustration was, is if you try to use the instructions uh, for, the, for the alignment in the service manual, they're taking into consideration that this was a functioning unit to begin with. So if there's another problem, uh, it's going to affect your test because they're actually having you pull the signal clear off of the outputs of your um, your RCA outputs that goes to your amplifier, you know. So it's going through all the other circuitry, the IF and the, everything else. If something is not working, <laughs> that that part of the service manual won't work. So that's why I said you kind of have to get creative. We know at this point in time that this circuit works and that the, the front end is working. Now there is one part here that we're not involving in this yet and that's this right here. And this right here is that whole Vericap VCO circuit. Okay so this VCO is going to be controlled by your synthesizer circuit and I'm still having problems with the synthesizer because the PLL will not lock. So the first thing I wanted to make sure is everything's working up here. I still think I have a problem here and I think it's that Vericap diode which is I don't know if you could see it. I'll try to point to it. It's right here. Right there is your Vericap diode. I think that it's it gets noisy or it gets unstable as you apply a higher voltage to it. It's supposed to produce it's supposed to be 33 picofarads with 4 volts induced across it. And at the lower voltages like that when I'm at 8 volts and so forth, it's fine. But when I get up to the to the adjustment that you do with 17 volts, that's where you start seeing problems. It becomes very unstable. It jumps around. Uh, we have issues, and that's why I'm thinking that's what it is. Um, so there you go. Now let's take a little look at some theory, and uh, give me a chance to blow my nose and get some some other paperwork out here, <laughs> and I'll be right back. 
The good news for all of you is that the kind of viruses that my nose produces and the kind of viruses that your computer produces are not interchangeable. So even though I have a cold, you guys are safe. Isn't that cool? <laughs> even if you don't have an antivirus on your computer. All right, enough silliness. So here's a block diagram I printed out because I can't see this stuff and I hate this small print I printed it out and I like to kind of as I figure things out you know this is a good exercise to do as you're looking you know going through and troubleshooting something it's always good to get a paper copy of the section you're working on and take notes as you're as you're going through things so that's what I've done here and if you look Let's uh, get this camera here. I, if I open my lens all the way um, on this camera, I have a, uh, a filter on it now to kind of filter out the glare. And that filter shims my, my uh, wide angle lens far enough away from the main lens of this camera that you can actually see that little circle. See there how you can see on the four corners, you see like the little cropping. And that's what that's from. But the nice thing is, I can, by rotating my lens and rotating that polarized filter, I can take out a lot of the glare and things. And I think the image looks better when we do that. So anyhow, right here, you see antenna, single tune. This is, this is where that test point one and two is on the schematic. So if we look right here, that's, that's right in this area. And we're looking at the block diagram here. And then we go into our RF amp. Then we go into two gangs of our tuning capacitor. So there it is, two gangs. Go into second RF amplifier, which is Q2, this guy right here. Then you go into another double gang. And then we come out of there. And we go into our mixer circuit which is right here and that's that's the the dual gate MOSFET and that's Q3 uh, and then here's your IF coming out of there now your mixer signal part of it part of your local oscillator is done on the RF board on the FM front end board and part of it is your synthesizer board so What's happening right now is this is a really crazy circuit. It took me a while to understand what they're what they're trying to do. So first thing we have this little buffer amp which is Q6. Q6 is this JFET right here. And you're going to find out that if you look at the theory of operation some of it is not really clear. But this is actually just a buffer that is introducing your local oscillator into your mixer. The local oscillator actually is this circuit right here. And in order for it to find its frequency, you know, on a normal analog tuner, you'd take, you'd take this and you'd have another tuning gang that would be tuned to your 10.7 megahertz higher or lower whatever they're doing and you would have two tracking frequencies as you turn the tuning dial both both your tank circuit up here for your you know for your tuning and your local oscillator capacitor they're physically ganged together they would rotate together and they would change together what they're doing here is they're taking a reference oscillator and they're using that encoder plate and all that to create a very accurate error-free uh, local oscillator frequency and they're doing that through that PLL circuit which is looped in with that with that reference oscillator that 10.2325 megahertz and then it's creating a voltage level that represents the frequency of your local oscillator. That voltage then 
affects D1, which is this varicap, and this varicap changes its capacitance to vary the frequency. And there's a truth table in there that shows you what it should be and all that. That's why you have to be over each digital step every 200 kilohertz. It actually is a digitally produced word, but here's the strange thing is they're using a very simple crystal oscillator for that 10.2325 and if that's not accurate the the rest of this is completely down the drain <laughs> so that's the weak spot of this circuit I believe nose blowing time okay good for a couple more minutes so the problem with this is to get a varicap diode that have, would have the capacitance range to go all the way from the low, of, low end of the band scale, which is your 87.5 megahertz, all the way up to 107.5, they're just that kind of component doesn't exist. So what they had to do is they had to break up this local oscillator into two ranges. Now, if you look here, there's D2. D2 is a steering diode. It kind of works as a switch. And when this thing is turned on by this line right here, pin 6, it actually introduces this 7 picofarad capacitor to ground and kind of shunts it across this D1 to lower the range. So anytime you're below, and I wrote this down, anytime you're below... 98.3 megahertz this diode is turned on and this 7 picofarad is essentially ganged in with D1 to lower the range of the oscillator <coughs> that way you can have a range of voltages that will will only you only have to vary that half of the range that it needs to be if that makes any sense to you. Now in order to do that it has to know when to change the the, the uh, VCO um, or the the voltage for the VCO and the way it does that is with that photo sensor <coughs> sorry it comes out of here it's one of the photo sensors has that range on it it goes through this little DC amp and it goes up here and that's what toggles it on and off sorry about that so this here if you notice I have this note 7 picofarads is when D2 is on and that's range 1 87.5 to 98.3 when we're at 98.5 and above D2 turns off, it takes the 7 picofarad capacitor out of the circuit, everything's good. Now, why am I making a deal out of this? Well, if you recall, the, one of the problems that we're having, we have two problems that I'm seeing right now. Problem number one is that when I'm in that upper range above 98.5, the, the local oscillator becomes unstable. Now, there's two things that can cause that. Number one is that the varicap diode itself may have a problem at that frequency. Or number two, it might be something to do with, with that toggle circuit. And it, you know, something is wrong with the 7 picofarad, with, with this circuit right here, there may be noise. And yes, I did scope all of the uh, power supplies they're as clean as can be. Um, I've gotten many comments, you know, I would recap this thing before I even started. Well, in a normal circumstance, I would. But this, there's two things going for this. Number one, we don't know if this thing's going to have a problem that isn't worth fixing to the owner. Number two, uh, I think that if we do recap this thing, uh, ahead of time it unless it, the caps are causing a problem right now you know what I mean I just think it's uh, extra work that we don't really need the owner 
doesn't know whether he wants to uh, put that kind of money in it because um, he may want to sell this after it's fixed. And so we were going to try to get it to a working order before we determined whether we want to invest the money and time into uh, completely restoring everything in it. So, and I do think if we get this working properly, we will probably go on and do the recap. But I don't think recapping it at this point in time is going to change our problem because the things that I'm seeing in here don't really have any, we're not at the point where the electrolytic capacitors are even playing a big role in our problem right now. Uh, we're not looking at audio problems in the audio path. Uh, we're not seeing problems in the voltage power supplies. And really those are the two things that the capacitors would affect the most. <coughs> so I don't know that it's really worth going on that tangent right now. Now, so <clears throat> that's problem number one, is that unstable local oscillator at the high frequency ranges, stable local oscillator at the lower frequency ranges. So that's our first thing. And it does toggle. I do see that toggle happen. So that's good. Now, our second problem is not on the uh, front end board, but rather has to do with the synthesizer circuit. And that is, I still cannot get this PLL to ever lock. It will not lock. No matter what kind of signal I put in, I can use my, uh, you know, I can use my signal generator and kind of inject signals. It will not go into a lock state. Now, that could be there are a whole myriad of reasons, but I still feel that this oscillator circuit, this reference oscillator circuit, is causing us a problem. Now, what can we do to prove that? Well, I could possibly inject a signal somehow in here. You know, I'd have to somehow pull a component to isolate this circuit, but I could inject a signal in there and see if it locks on at least one frequency. So I'm thinking about that. But if you also notice, <coughs> you have your VCO in and you have your output. Um, hold on, nose blow time. Well, I'm thinking to myself, who in the hell would want to watch a video of some guy blowing his nose. Good grief. You guys are long suffering for putting up with this. <laughs> so anyways, I still think there's a problem in here somewhere. I'm pretty confident that all this is working properly on this end now. And uh, <clears throat> I think whatever's going on is something in here. So we have to troubleshoot those two problems. And I think if we get those two problems fixed, the rest of it's going to fall into place. Now, there are some other things that are different about this tuner than just this unique circuit. And that is that this has to be one of the most accurate signal strength meters I've ever seen in a FM tuner. And the reason I say that is this has its own little IF circuit all on its own strictly for controlling the signal strength meter. And the whole theory behind why they're doing this is this signal strength meter is closer to what you'd see in a ham radio than in what you would see in a commercial use FM tuner for your stereo. In that <clears throat> it if it's set up properly it will give you an actual representation of the real signal strength coming into the antenna jack of the tuner in femtowatts. That's pretty amazing when you think about it. It actually will tell you the signal strength. Now, why would we need to know that? Well, we really don't. Uh, we're not, uh, we're not going to give a, a receive report, you know, you're five and nine <laughs> on, on stereo 96.2. But 
it is kind of a novel thing to have something like that. They thought of everything when they designed this. Um, so when you think about it, it's pretty cool. And, you know, giving working on this now, I kind of have respect for why they did what they did. I think what they're looking for is you're, you have the tuning capability of an analog tuner on the front end, but the rest of the tuner kind of works like a synthesized tuner, a modern tuner. And I think, number one, this is kind of a, an evolutionary type of, of device. And also, I think it was them trying to get the best of both worlds, you know, the analog and the digital world together. So it is pretty cool. And if we can ever see this thing work, I, I do believe it is going to be a super sensitive, very accurate tuner because really your your tuning of the stations is done in an analog ma manner, but your local oscillator is being derived separately in a digital manner. And the only way they could reconcile those two is instead of sampling your tuner and go, going from A to D and then converting it into a digital word, they're actually using that little encoder, that optical photo sensor, uh, in place of that to mechanically sense where you're tuning. The problem with that is if you don't have this lined up properly with those little tick marks on that photo sensor, no matter how hard you try to align this, it will never come in. So, you know, it's very, you know, they go through a big process of setting the tuner, uh, the pointer of the tuner to the dial scale to that frequency plate, you know, that, that photo sensor plate. It's a big deal how they have you align that. <clears throat> and what I found is, even with that, the position of this wheel on the tuning gang can be out. So you may have to loosen the set screw and just barely adjust it so that you truly are on that. And I wouldn't know how you would, how you would know that unless you could measure it <clears throat> with a spectrum analyzer or a frequency counter or something that would give you an exact repre representation of the frequency that you're tuning. So that's how I did it. Um, so, and it worked. So we're back to this. <clears throat> that's where I am right now with this whole thing. My nose is starting to run more and more and more, so that's telling me I'm running out of time here. But you are pretty much updated with where I am, and as I start feeling a little better, I'll put a little more time on this, and I should know a little bit better where I am uh, as soon as I'm done. You know, with I'm going to go through this a little more and take some more measurements, and hopefully... I should have some good news in the next video. So this is turning out into a much bigger video series than I ever anticipated it to be. But I will say, I'm learning a lot and I'm really enjoying it, uh, believe it or not. At first I didn't, but now that I'm starting to understand it and appreciate it, uh, this is fun. This is a fun project. So uh, for those of you who've been sticking with the series the whole way through, I appreciate your patience and hope that you're at least entertained, if not learning something. I know I'm learning something. And till next time, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health. <laughs> Unlike my health. <laughs> and no colds. Uh, and so stay well. And till next video, take care. Bye-bye.